um, in year six was it was quite distressing. I felt quite low ability after that because all my friends got level five and I'm getting level four. But then when I actually got to secondary school, I actually found out when we, um, when we were put into groups and based after teachers that had not only tested us but observed us as well, I was actually putting all the, all, in all the subjects in the higher ability group. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Mick, what about... I mean, clearly, some people do have a tough time after SATs. It has a negative impact upon yeah. them or about the way they yeah. see themselves. I think there's a very high correlation between those children who are given a sense of, of failure, uh, not just at 10, but actually earlier than that. I uh, do so think, though, the, the, the other interesting thing uh, we talk to children about exams is that it affects... What they're very aware of is that it affects their relationship... Uh, again, uh, upwards laterally with adults. You know, mm. if they get bad examples, it, it, it's to do with the relationship they have with their parents and their expectations of their parents and their teachers. It isn't so important, again, in their sort of horizontal relationship with their friends mm. and with the, their peers. I don't remember anyone ever getting particularly upset that they got a bad mark in maths, but I remember a lot of people getting upset they didn't get into the football team. Sheila Lawler. If we could agree that we had short externally set tests in English and in, in mathematics, then I think we'd be halfway to getting rid of the problem of very heavy assessment models. But teachers would have to as- accept written tests, and I don't think m- might you do that. Well, the problem still seems to be when it, it's not just about testing the child, it's about testing the school so it can go into a league table. And if there's some other way in which parents can make a decision about schools rather than the, mm. than the SATs results, then maybe there's a way forward. Well, it's hard to believe, really, especially in the context of this discussion, but it's not actually that long that education has been the business of government, is it? It used to be yeah. the churches who, who organised education. So, Mike, just take us back to how the whole thing started. Well, that's right. I mean, there was great reluctance from government in, in this country to get involved in running schools at all, well after other countries were doing it. Actually, Scotland was doing it well uh, well before England was, but other countries were way ahead, and we were very reluctant. So it was left to the church societies, and of course that's why we still have so many church uh, primary schools today. And it's quite interesting, too, also, that, that that's, a, that's a legacy which means we still have a lot of uh, religion in schools compared to the United States, and yet they're a much more religious society, which is interesting, isn't it? And then we moved on. Eventually, local councils came into it at the beginning of the 20th centre and they ran schools pretty much for a while and then I think there was a period probably in the sort of 60s 70s post plan when actually teachers were more or less deciding what went into schools but since the 80s it's very very much we've had a, a nationalised I and mean, it's interesting that it came from a conservative government effectively they nationalised schools in terms of the curriculum and testing not in terms of uh, uh, day-to-day management because that power was given down to schools and I think now we're at a very interesting crossroads again where we may be moving somewhere else if the conservatives come in they've got this idea of following the Swedish model where any group can come forward where it's parents or others could set up a school in an office, never mind a school, and, and get a, a per-pupil funding so they could do it that way. And that really happens in Sweden. It does. I've been to visit them. I've seen them in, in schools, which, you know, which no, looks nothing like a school from the outside. Uh, and they've had some interesting results. A lot of new providers have come in. There's a really interesting debate about it. And, of course, there are others who say we should go even further and which say we should just have a voucher system. So, actually, in the end, parents would decide. Uh, they would run the schools because they would take their voucher to the schools that they liked. Now, there are all sorts of issues and problems with that as well. But there are, I think that's where we're at a very interesting interesting point politically now in, in who runs schools. A question from the audience. Thank you. Hello, yes. My name is Stuart Ware. Um, I'm not a, a parent. Uh, I'm not a teacher. I am an uncle. I don't know whether that counts. <laughs> um, I don't know anyone who goes to church, but I've got a, got a number of friends who are a bit upset that the only school available in their area is a religious school, especially in the countryside. I just wonder what can be done to make things better for parents who are non-religious, their children, to sort of make their own minds up rather than being indoctrinated in in one faith or another. Well, may I come in on that? I think there's a very clear answer. We have, under the 1870 Act, and it is still in place, I discussed with the head teacher only today, parents have the right to withdraw their children from religious instruction if it is not in accord with their own conscience or religious beliefs. Now, in 1870, when they brought that act in, they obliged schools to have religious education at the beginning or end of day so it would be easier for parents to do And I think that's a perfectly liberal solution. Anybody else like to comment on that, John? Yeah, I think when we talk about religion in schools, we don't often talk about about non-religion in schools, but it seems to me that we're dealing with these large questions. You know, why are we here how did the universe come in, into being and so on and I think as well as teaching children about religion they should also teach children about atheism after all a large number of people in our society are have no religious faith there's now 
a tradition of thinking in a secular way about these matters that goes back to the 18th century and before. Uh, and yet children are not put in touch with this. The question, does God exist, <coughs> as far as I know, does not appear in the RE syllabus. Steve. Well, uh, it's a weird one, this, because um, I'm not sure you can discuss uh, th those sorts of topics before you are intellectually equipped to do so. I don't see any point of discussing those things at primary level. I think if you start trying to talk to six or seven or eight-year-olds about it, all they're going to do is go, they're going to parrot what their parents have told them which is worse than pointless. We began this part of the discussion by discussing uh, the influence of the, the Christian churches on, on primary school education and education generally. There are now, of course, uh, lots of other faiths with, with their own schools. Um, Mick, I mean, is it something that your organisation approves of? Uh, we, we first of all need to blow some this. I, had, I went to a, a wonderful school uh, which was uh, mainly Pakistani heritage uh, children, Islamic faith uh, in Bradford, and I went in the school and, and they were learning about Hanukkah. Uh, so uh, I, I think it's important that we, you know, we don't get this sort of uh, twisted and biased view of what's happening. But I do think that the role of religion in primary schools and actually educating children about religion is fundamentally important because uh, you, we've all seen uh, the rise of, of religious-based uh, violence. And this is a world which our children are going to grow up in unless we can educate them to not only have tolerance but also embrace the faith of others, then I think we're, we are moving into an extremely dangerous world. And the only way we're going to deal with that world is to make sure children leave our schools with a balanced view. Let's just hear from the audience. Hi there. I'm a professor of education at the University of Derby. And I think the panel have missed the key point here that's changed in schools, and so has the audience, and that um, if you look at it, schools spend far much, too much time now, the whole range of things like circle time, emotional literacy. And if you wanted to identify the real shift, one um, secondary school teacher said to me, you know something's changed when children want to know more about themselves than the world. And that's what's happened in primary schools, and that's the most significant shift. You're not educating now, you're playing with their emotions. Well, you're, you're seriously suggesting that children are too inward-looking, or they're being made to be inward-looking? They're being made, and they're being made helpless and hapless through this process as well. Yeah. Are, are, you, are you talking here about SEAL? This is social and emotional aspects of learning. Well, it's partly primary SEAL, but it's not, it, it, it goes right across the curriculum. That's why it's a mistake to say that the subjects are much the same. Because mm. what goes on in those classes, whether it's biscuit-making, or whether it's geography, or whether it's history, has this thing about looking at your own emotions... And the idea of being a motivating teacher, which everybody's talking about, is all about relating. So it's all about personal relationships. And that is a significant shift. It's something that's mm. never happened before in the history of education. And, and, you, and you're, in your view, it's entirely wrong. It's entirely wrong and entirely dangerous because schools used to be havens from the normal world. You put your troubles in a carrier bag, you came into school and you learned something. And there was also class division clearly happening in a lot of schools, where in a lot of primary schools you'll get a lot of focus on emotional activities, emotional learning, emotional intelligence, and in secondary schools. In selective schools, like, they're getting a traditional curriculum. So you're seeing developing within the British educational system a divide, which is actually worse than the old-fashioned divide where you had the working class or thick kids and the better-off kids who were rich. We're getting a divide that's based around the emotions. And obviously, it doesn't take much intelligence to see that when you see that children are difficult and have got emotional problems... It's like the old-fashioned way of looking at ordinary people and saying, you know, they're not capable. But now it's not about their intellect, it's about their emotions. All right, um, thank you for that. Well, what, um, what are we to make of this, Mike Baker? What was the intention of initiatives like SEAL? I, mean, I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, just to put against that, I suppose, uh, the government would say they're really concerned about the, the, the well-being...